I'm going to talk about cultural capability. Um, throughout my whole life, I've always heard people talk about you've got to be culturally appropriate. You've got to have effective service delivery for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. And so I ask today, what is it? What is culturally appropriate? Do we need it? And more importantly, how do we measure it? So the work I'm currently leading in government now is actually developing a cultural capability framework where it's actually sustainable and you actually measure your effectiveness. Um, what the evidence suggests is that if we undertake culturally effective services, it actually increases and improves outcomes for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Someone's just talked about the health department. Um, you know, delivering effective services not only does services, but for the business and the bean counters in the office, it actually reduces your bottom line too. It actually saves you money if you're doing more effective service delivery. So today I'll discuss five key components what um, I believe in and what I'm leading within government around what culturally effective or culturally appropriate service delivery is. By no means, and I respectfully acknowledge other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in the room, there is others which we build onto, but I believe these are, are the start or the foundation. If you as an agency or an individual actually follow these steps, you'll actually be a more effective service delivery. So the first one is about valuing culture, the very essence, and these actually go in order, one to five. Valuing culture. If we recognise, respect and value Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander culture as the fundamental to improving service delivery, you'll go a long way. We as a nation have started that in regards to the apology, understanding of history, our cultural awareness sessions, on the continuum of understanding what Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people go to when you're actually dealing with them as a client, the valuing of that culture is at the very essence. Some of the measures could be around this is that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander culture is recognised and valued and embedded within your agency's business. You actually do that. You name it, there's significant events every year. Agencies understand the value their clients and their cultural aspirations play. And also agencies recognise and commemorate significant Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander events, not just NAIDOC. We come together one week every year to celebrate our wonderful blackness. There's more to us than that. And more importantly, agencies recognise and respect traditional owners and custodians and elders. And more importantly, they engage, like Solomon talked about, all the time. Engage, don't just engage because you need to. Engage to build a relationship. How many times in government's been guilty of this too? Oh, we need to develop a policy and it's got something to do with blackfellas. Oh, we're going to engage with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. And you have to develop a relationship around that. What this value in culture means is that on an ongoing basis, we need to have an ongoing relationship with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, clients and communities. So that's the first one. The second one is leadership and accountability. First, you understand the culture. Second, if it's not driven by leadership, in Selwyn's point, the senior officers have to be at the front. If your senior leadership and all the leaders are not accountable and demonstrating and promoting cultural capability, it will not work. It can't be from the bottom up. It, it's been happening for years where we've survived as a race because it's been the bottom up. But leadership, accountability. Some of the measures could be that the CEO accepts accountability and leads this across the agency. They do, him or her, lead this across the agency. Then all staff take responsibility for promoting and contributing to the cultural capability what is set within the agency. And then agencies embed the cultural capability framework in their governance and mechanisms. So we have achievement plans in, in government where every staff member has that. In our achievement plans now, we have a cultural capability section where we sit down and say, a key component of your employment is cultural capability. You must demonstrate that and we will give you the tools necessary to do that. So that's the second one. The third one, I believe, is um, cultural capability and presence in the workforce, and this takes two parts. Simply, agencies actively increase Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander employment in their agencies. There's no better sight than if you walk into an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander... If the AMS didn't have Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people at their front counter, I would suggest there would be issues within regards to the connecting and engaging. I'm not saying they all have to be that, but you must have... A, it's that natural ability to connect straight away with community because they understand. It's the ability to have the person at the front door. Agencies also actively improve Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander retention rates. We leave jobs quicker than anyone else. <laughs> and that's a fact. We go into jobs, but we churn. No more evident than in government at this present time. 
Agencies ensure that cultural capability is embedded in all workforce management practices and processes, and that all staff have the knowledge, skills and behaviours to effectively interact with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. That's the stuff you've got to build into an achievement capability plan. I, I in my substantive role, am based out of the Logan Central Child Safety Office, which is the highest, one of the highest offices in regards to young people in care. And as of the induction process, I sat down and said to the officer, oh, I've just started my first week. I said, oh, as part of your induction, are you going visiting the local Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander services? She said, no. I said, yet 40% of your caseloads are Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander. So now it's built into their achievement and capability plan. The fourth one, and so on, and this is what the concept of, of today is about, is Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander engagement. It needs to be sustained, respectful, and inclusive engagement that is essential to gaining the understanding of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander perspectives. I repeat that, to gain their perspectives, not we have a product, here it is. How do they fit in? And engage all the time, not for purpose. Some of the, some of the measures for that may be agencies effectively engage Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, not just from their local area, but if their program runs in urban, regional and remote, engage with people from urban, regional and remote, because we are different. Also within the Torres Strait, we are different. Um, another measure is for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people to be engaged in the development of policy and programs at the outset. We have a tendency of going, here's a policy, here's an initiative, and a key target group's Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. So we've already, got, we've already developed the policy, now we'll go and talk to them about it. Instead of actually saying, before we develop the policy, we know that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people need to be engaged, let's engage them at the outset. And you do this by having engagement mechanisms on an ongoing basis. And that staff are supported to actually do this. If you're a manager and you're sitting in the office, the time you take for a week induction could be life-changing, not only to you, but the minister talked about it before, client focus. I say to my staff every day, if you're, you're not here to improve the lives of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, you need to look for another job. And the very essence of induction around cultural capability is that if you as our service providers and we don't have a lot of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander services left, so we rely on you to ensure that we have the best product. And the last one is around a culturally responsive service system. And, and, and it again is it at the forefront that we actually embed the cultural capability principles are embedded in your policy program and practice. A simple exercise is every time you develop a business unit plan, if you're engaging with the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community on a regular basis, ask them what they'd like included in their business plan. It's actually a feedback what Selwyn talked about in regards to how you engage and get feedback from your client. How effective are you unless you actually ask? How many services have an ongoing mechanism where they ask Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people about the effect of service delivery? That's cultural capability. So um, I want to thank you for that. Again, I'll go through the five areas. So it's valuing culture first. Leadership and accountability must drive it. A cultural capability and presence in the workforce around the employment and retention. Engaging with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people on an ongoing basis. And then this will ensure that you have a culturally responsive service system. Um, I believe they're the steps to take and what I'm leading within government. So thank you for, for your time.